Perhaps no greater interest that one could take is the study of law and religion. I mean, after all, those two particular fields of study are something that gives a lot of grist for the mill. Hello, you have tuned in to Global Faith and Freedom, and I'm your host today, Barry Bussey. Join me and my special guests for the next 30 minutes as we discuss law and religion. Joining us today to discuss the whole study of law and religion, we have Professor John Whitty uh, from this, the uh, Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University. It's good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. John Graz from the International Religious Liberty Association. Thank well, you very much, Barry. And we also have Todd McFarland, who's an Associate General Counsel for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Welcome, Todd. It's great to be here. Uh, we'll start with you, Professor Whitty, as you... Um, are the director of this center down at Emory University. It's really unique. I mean, I don't know of uh, too many other uh, programs that are around that incorporate the study of religion for ministerial students and law students. So how does that work? And tell us a little bit about your program. So we started about 25 years ago, and when we started, we were unique. There were a few canon law programs, a few Jewish law programs, but in law schools, there was nothing like we're doing now. Mm. Happily around the world, there are about 40 such centers uh, that have sprung up in the last 10 years to deal with the issues of law and religion. But we do a study what we call the legal dimensions of religion, the religious dimensions of law, and the interaction of legal and religious ideas and institutions, methods, and practices. We focus uh, Abrahamically on Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. We look at the fundamentals of faith, freedom, of family. We're interested in Islamic legal studies, Christian legal studies, Jewish legal studies. We're interested in the moral foundations of law, of religious freedom, of religious foundations of human rights, of issues of marriage, family, sexuality, and children. And we try to study those in a way that's interreligious, interdisciplinary, and international in focus. We have about 95 faculty who work with us, 1,600 scholars from around the world. Uh, we've published 350 books. We've been at this for 25 years wow. and happily now uh, being imitated by better institutions around the world. Well, I, well, I, I mean, I wouldn't say about better. That, <laughs> I mean, uh, it's certainly uh, a wonderful reputation of uh, your center has around the world in, in this whole thing. Um, as we look at the issue of law and religion, I mean, why would we want to study it? Why is it so important? And obviously, it's, a, it's a, certainly a growth area in the academic world, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, but why are we studying this? Well, look at the front page of every newspaper today and it becomes pretty obvious that religion is a factor of human life that has to be dealt with in a serious way, legally, politically, socially, culturally. Uh, the assumption of the 1950s and 60s that religion was on its last legs, that it would die a happy death, mm -hmm. uh, that we could uh, finally get on with the great uh, secular project of post-modernity uh, has now belied by the great awakening of religion around the world today in many of its benign forms, but also in many do belligerent and hard forms to deal with. In this globalized world, you cannot ignore religion anymore. Religion is now front and center of what we do. Mm -hmm. And we have complicated legal systems and political systems in place internal to religious communities that have to be better understood. And we have to rethink our traditional common law, civil law, and international law categories for, that can now take into account religion and all of its uh, unique formulations today. Mm -hmm. And that goes from the questions of how to deal with uh, a divorce uh, from a, uh, a warring religious family uh, that want to operate per halakha or sharia or Christian canon law to trying to negotiate a multilateral treaty to deal with the hardest questions uh, of religious terrorism. That whole range of issues is now very much central to uh, legal and political and diplomatic education today. Wow. John? When I, I was interested about religious freedom and uh, I decided that I should study history mm. and history of religion. But you know, it's very important on a practical way to know what are your rights? What is your right, you know, when you are a believer? Mm. And because most of the time, you know, we don't know our rights and we don't know the process of the law. We don't know how we can change the law. We believe that things are like that and uh, we have to live with. 
but you know, studying law help us really to, to change things. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Todd, you've studied law. I have. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> Professor Wright, one of the things I think is interesting. Just call me John. Please, John. <laughs> one of the things I think is interesting is, you know, first of all, courts often have a very difficult time dealing with, with these issues. I mean, there seems to be a great need to educate uh, judges and lawyers on when religious issues come up, how to deal with it. What can they permissibly inquire about? What they can't, what, how should the law approach? I mean, a lot of times, just there seems to be this reflexive willingness, well, we're just gonna be neutral on this. And we're, we're, you know, we're not gonna take any stance, we're just gonna stay out of it. But, you know, many times, by purportedly staying neutral, they're actually taking a stance. They're actually coming down on one particular side. And so I, I do think this is a very important area to educate, uh, especially even people that are practitioners, because I can say from my own litigation experience working for the church, the level of knowledge that a lot of lawyers and judges who are otherwise bright people have on these issues can be shockingly little. Yeah, and I think that's just a, a symptom or a feature of the reality that we had this positivist paradigm of legal education. That law was an autonomous science, that law had its own method, its own manner, its own language, and that law didn't have to be understood in, concert, in context or in concert with other disciplines. What's emerged over the last uh, 30 years in interdisciplinary legal study altogether is that we recognize that law has to be understood in part in conversation with economics, politics, psychology, a range of other humane and social sciences, and that likewise we have to take law into account in conversation with religion and theology just a complicated understanding of law as a practical uh, profession uh, mm -hmm. requires a, a much richer and fuller education than students historically had. The great leaders of the bench and the bar today were educated under the old positivist paradigm, and you're encountering, as you just described, uh, some of this ignorance, amongst other things, about religion. That's changing rather dramatically. Very few students now graduate law school without having at least a basic course in religious freedom, having an exposure to a religious legal system, recognizing the religious elements of labor law or employment law or zoning law. These things are now part of the conversation uh, that any lawyer in private and public practice, both domestic and internationally, has to encounter. And it's because religion is there and has to be dealt with in a serious way. It was like for a certain amount of time that as a society we, we simply tried to somehow jettison religion from, from the study. And uh, yet, uh, you know, as we've been in law school, we saw the very early, very early on, you know, the whole idea, the concept of equity, which came out of the, you know, the, the church. Uh, and, yet, uh, and yet many of the legal scholars uh, just said, like you say, just uh, let's, let's throw this out. Let's not bother with it. It's, it's unimportant, but we are finding it's more and more important. What specific areas, uh, like when a law student comes into Emory, uh, they know, I'm just wondering what kind of a courses would they have or an opportunity to be able to, uh, to take in your center? So students can walk in and they can do a joint degree program, a law degree and a theology degree concurrently. Uh, they will have a range of 39 courses available to them that they can take in the course of doing their two degrees concurrently. Wow. Uh, courses in, in canon law, courses in Jewish law, courses in Islamic law, Islam and politics, Judaism and politics, uh, history of church-state relations in the West, American religious freedom, um, a number of courses on law, religion, and family, law, religion, and charity, comparative hermeneutics, looking at legal, theological, and literary texts, uh, comparative ethics, legal, theological, and professional. That range of courses wow. is available to students mm -hmm. in Emory in general, but they're particularly targeted for students that are doing joint degrees. Wonderful. We teach um, probably 1,500 students a year in the 40 courses that we offer uh, in law and religion at, on the campus. And, and have, have you found that the, uh, the interest level in these courses have gone up over, uh, over time? Every year when I grade my exams, the answer, unfortunately, is yes. And I, <laughs> okay. it's, it's wonderful to teach, and it's wonderful to have 120 kids in your class, but it, the, the bane of this is uh, the exams. Awesome. <laughs> uh, but there's just a thirst for knowledge of these things, and yeah. it's a fascinating topic. People are, are curious at minimum, yeah. increasingly passionate about the need to understand the legal dimensions of religion, the religious dimensions of law. People are beginning to realize that we have to deal with Judaism, Christianity, Islam, but now also in this globalized society, Hinduism, Confucianism, Taoism, indigenous religions of various mm. sort. You can't have a sophisticated legal practice. You can't have a sophisticated pastoral practice anymore without understanding the other and mm. understanding them in all of their interdisciplinary diversity. Part of what we're doing in our center is catering to that new need that people are now perceiving. Okay, great. Well, as soon as we come back, we will find out some more about the study of law and religion. Stay with us.
you're serious about religious freedom, you will want Dr. John Graz's new book, Issues of Faith and Freedom. Dr. Graz has traveled the world advocating the right of individuals to practice their faith. He knows of what he speaks. You've asked these questions many times. Why do Christians defend religious freedom? Should Christians be involved in politics or in interfaith dialogue? Get the answers from a man of experience and knowledge of religious freedom. Supplies are limited, so act now. For only $15 plus shipping and handling, we will send you Issues of Faith and Freedom by Dr. John Graz. To order your copy today, call 805-955-7675 or write Global Faith and Freedom, 101 West Cochrane Street, Simi Valley, California, 93065. You can also order online at globalfaithandfreedom.org. Get your copy today. Inspirational, powerful, entertaining. Audiences everywhere enjoy and benefit from Global Faith and Freedom. And now for the first time ever, you can obtain the official Global Faith and Freedom DVD set. This dynamic television talk show combines the controversial issues in religion and politics with thoughtful, meaningful discourse from the experts in the field. A talk show on religious freedom has never been better than this. Call now and get 13 unforgettable episodes of Global Faith and Freedom for just $20 plus shipping and handling. You can also sign up to automatically receive future episodes as they become available for the same low price. Precedent setting Global Faith and Freedom now on DVD. Don't miss this opportunity to bring it home and share with family and friends. Global Faith and Freedom. We bring you the issues of the world. Welcome back to Global Faith and Freedom, and today we're talking about law and religion. I'm just wondering, John, if you could tell us about the, the study of legal systems within religion, because that would be an area that uh, your center would be involved with. Yeah, it is an area we're involved in, and it's an important and growing topic of interest today. Uh, every major religious tradition has an internal legal structure. Mm. Uh, in Judaism, it's halakha. In Islam, it's Sharia. In Christianity, it's a form of canon law or ecclesiastical discipline. Now, and, and each of those is a living legal system that operates internally to the church for its voluntary membership. Okay, now, d just for our listeners, uh, for our viewers, the, uh, when we say canon law, we often think of, you know, simply the Catholic Church, but mm -hmm. there's a canon law also within a Protestant mm -hmm. uh, Context. So there's an Orthodox canon law and a Catholic canon law and then variations on them in different mm -hmm. parts of the world. Okay. Protestants always have a form of ecclesiastical discipline or a set of church orders or internal working structures. Sometimes those are informal, sometimes those are formal, uh, but even if they're informal, internal to the church, when there's pressure uh, by the external <laughs> legal system on the church, mm -hmm. those internal documents, those internal mechanisms of, of dispute resolution and the like are really important and they oftentimes, increasingly today, under litigation pressure, are being uh, reduced to written form. Mm. So now, uh, within, within these um, uh, particular systems, uh, to what extent are you studying those, or would the students be involved in studying those? So in our center, you can study all three of those legal systems in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam uh, historically and today and see them as living legal systems of the past and le living legal systems today. Mm -hmm. You can also study the interaction between those internal uh, legal systems of faith communities uh, and the secular legal systems in which they are embedded, uh, whether in North America or around the world. Mm -hmm. When these religious communities are in uh, majority contexts, sometimes their religious legal systems spill over uh, into the secular legal system. And so the issue of whether Sharia is state law or internal mosque law, the issue of whether halakha is, is Israeli law uh, or simply the Jewish law of the state. And in certain uh, communities that still have Christian establishments, think of, of Russian, the Russian uh, Federation today, mm -hmm. uh, orthodox canon law plays a very critical role in the uh, legal system of, of uh, post-Glasnost Russia. 
So there's a, we, we spend time looking at uh, those legal, legal systems in operation uh, domestically and internationally. And we then spend time looking at what the implications of that are for a secular legal system because those boundaries are, also, are always being renegotiated. Mm -hmm. A good example is marriage and family and sexuality questions today. Okay. One of the big pressure points that, that we're going to face five or ten years down the road is the argument that voluntary faithful members of a particular religious community say a mosque or a temple or a church or a, um, an, another faith community, mm -hmm. don't accept the simple, easy in, easy out law of the state anymore with respect to marriage. They want, as voluntary faithful, to subject themselves to the legal system of their own faith community. They want to be subject to Christian canon law or halakha or sharia. And they want the states to defer to the internal decision making uh, of those religious communities. That's a fight that's just around the corner uh, mm -hmm. in North America. And it's a fight that's being joined very directly today uh, in Western Europe and in various parts of the world. And the question now is going to become, is marriage, family, sexuality questions, are those questions exclusively state questions? Or are those questions that are of shared jurisdiction where the religious communities have to, give a, have, to have a voice? Or can they be exclusively issues of religious jurisprudence, the law of, this, of the religious voluntary community? Uh, that's a, a, an issue we're going to be joining over the next 10 or 15 so, years. So in essence, what they'll, the, the, the struggle will be, look, the church has said this is a marriage. The state may say, no, it's not. Exactly. And then how do you resolve how do you that? Resolve that? Or we don't like what the state is going to do. We don't like unilateral divorce. We don't like the child custody arrangements. Right. We don't like the opportunity uh, not, not to have the privilege of corporal discipline for our kids. We would like to have primogenitor giving male only uh, inheritance rules. We'd like to have that for ourselves and we'd like to contract into that system for ourselves. And mm -hmm. the, question, the pressure that's going to be put on states is to say, you can't, as a matter of religious freedom, have that privilege, either as an individual joining the religious community or as a religious community claiming a given status in society as a legal unit. And the question then becomes, is it different from education or charity or other areas where we have shared jurisdiction or is it something new? Wow. That's a big contest That is a big road. one. That's, that's going to be exciting to watch for sure. Todd? Yeah, you know, I would say... You know, there's going to be, and I agree with John that this is going to be a big fight, there is going to be sort of reflexive, well, of course we can't defer. We've got to stay, you know, again, as I said before, you know, neutral in issues of religion. You know, the problem with that is we allow people to organize their affairs in a binding way all the time. And, you know, this entire contract law is simply that. I mean, there is very little in contract law that is actually required, uh, especially when you're dealing with entities of equal, um, sort of equal status. Uh, so we do have certain regulations and securities and so forth when you're dealing with a big company, a small person. But you have two individuals who want to agree to something. The state will enforce that all the time. I mean, it does it routinely. Yet I think the question is, is religion going to be given sort of that same level of deference from the government, which is we're just enforcing what you have decided or allowing you to, uh, uh, you know, to organize your affairs as you see fit. And I think there's going to be a lot of pushback um, because the way this is going to get presented is, you know, a person, you know, the typical case is going to be someone who opted into the system voluntarily, then for whatever reason decides they're not going to benefit from it, and then they're going to back out of it. In contract law, we call that breach, and you can't do it. Once you agree to something, you're stuck with it. But it's going to get, I think, I think it's going to get um, cast as, well, a civil right. You know, right. this is my right, right not right. to be stuck with the system that I already agreed to. Uh, wow. I mean, what, what, what a mixture, John. No, uh, just, John, do you think that it's specific to the United States, or you can see that uh, the trend around the world? Oh, that's a trend around the, around world. the world. Very much so. I was, but uh, the, you know, it, the United States is ahead of that. Well, the United States is actually a little behind because these issues and on this question of whether a religious family law systems have a place in a, in a American democratic system. That question has been joined directly for the last 10 years uh, in Western Europe. Remember uh, Archbishop Rowan Williams yeah. saying Sharia is Sharia, unavoidable yeah, yeah. Right, you know, in, in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, when we come back, we're going to look further into this whole experience of law and religion and the future. Stay with us.
In an age of terrorism and increasing war, a new book addresses an age-old conundrum. How does a Christian who follows the command of Jesus to lay down the sword and pray for enemies remain a good citizen when the state calls for war? Should I Fight is a collection of essays that address that very problem. Edited by Barry W. Bussey, the Seventh-day Adventist representative at the United Nations, Should I Fight is a must-have volume for those who want to understand the history of the Seventh-day Adventist position on war and the modern challenges. What emerges clearly from all the essays is that the answer to the question, should I fight, can never be a simple, straightforward yes. Bussey's call to Christians to take a stand on conscience, rather than easily fit in with what society expects or the state wants, is timely and vital and needs to be heard far and wide among those who acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Order your copy today for just $19.95. To order your copy today, call 805-955-7675. Do you want to be on the cutting edge of what scholars are saying about religious freedom? Then you need to subscribe today to Fides et Libertas. Fides et Libertas is the academic journal of the International Religious Liberty Association. Scholars from around the world have written in this journal on such insightful topics as human dignity and freedom of conscience, faith-based family laws in Western democracies, and equality and non-discrimination. You will not want to miss out on getting your personal copy of this fantastic resource. Be informed. Be enlightened. Subscribe to Feed Us a Liberdust today for just $10 plus shipping and handling. Call 805-955-7675 or write Global Faith and Freedom, 101 West Cochrane Street, Simi Valley, California, 93065. You can also order online, globalfaithandfreedom.org. Order now. Welcome back to Global Faith and Freedom, and today we're talking about law and religion. As we were look, uh, talking about the interchurch disputes, and then they go to the, to the law, to the state legal system, to try to find a resolution. Todd, what's your experience? Well, my experience is that this comes up in two very broad categories. The first is employment. Someone is employed by a church, they get fired. Some people may agree, some people don't. They go to the court system to, to seek a resolution. But the more common situation is there's always a dispute over property. Mm. And what happens is there'll be a theological dispute of some stripe. Uh, everything from same-sex marriage to historically slavery, women's ordination, pick, pick all the hot-button debates. And there'll be a schism within the church or a separation. And then there's a question of who owns the property. Mm. And it's usually, you know, most churches, uh, their largest asset is real property, a church and the land that it sits on. And of course, the state can't stay neutral there. The state has to resolve who gets this. Because the other, only other way to resolve it is whoever happens to be the strongest. And in a civilized society, we can't have that. And so when, when the government gets asked to resolve who gets the property, uh, it can become very dicey because how do you determine what is the true Anglican church? What is the true Methodist church? What is the true Adventist church? How do you decide that? And what level of deference are you going to give to an internal church political or judicial structure that's made that determination. And it's a fine line because on one hand, if they simply say, well, we're going to give no deference, well, that's interfering with their free exercise rights to, to, to order their religion the way they want. If they say, well, we're going, to, um, we're going to enforce one particular view, well, then is that establishing that as the true religion of whatever denomination that happens to be? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in the U.S. and other countries, they have come up with systems in which to handle this. But quite frankly, none of them are, are 100% perfect. Uh, in your study, John, uh, you've seen other uh, countries dealing with this struggle, and how have they been able to resolve this, or is it still in flux? Yeah, I think the, um, what Todd just described as the American system of, of mm. a variety of different approaches is, is true around the world. It's okay. the doctrine of religious autonomy, or church autonomy, as it's sometimes called, and to what extent must a state defer to the autonomous internal structures of the church, and to what extent may the, may the state interfere, pierce the ecclesiastical veil, mm. uh, and begin to discern which of the parties have a, a more superior claim. Looking at this globally, uh, the, the tendency in a number of, of Western countries is what we call the deference approach, which says we're going to defer to the highest religious authority that those two disputants recognized before the dispute broke out. A council, a synod, a bishop, a, a pope, a patriarch. Um, 
the minority position, but a growing one, is the so-called neutral principles approach, which says that we're simply going to use neutral principles of law that we would apply to any nonprofit organization gone bust, be it assets in the bank, be it um, uh, people sitting in the pew, be it majority or minority voting rights, um, or be it the local council or the, or the governing body of that particular community. Deference is the preferred position, uh, the majority position, but a growing position of neutral principles is coming yeah. along, and then variations on the same. Okay. And, and what happened, John, when the church belonged to the state, like in some countries, yeah. and you have a dispute? Yeah, in the Department you know, of Religious the, the, the Affairs. Church, the, the church is <laughs> divided. Who take the decision? So this, is, this was the 18th century position in the West when we yeah. had an established faith. Yeah. The, the church was the Department of Religious Affairs for the state. Yeah. And so the state could simply pick which of those ecclesiastical sovereigns was doing its bidding. That, that tradition fell aside when we disestablished religion and we developed these two alternative models. In many Eastern European countries and, and the form, parts of the so former Soviet bloc, uh, where there are still departments of religious affairs, they have the autonomy that historically was, was enjoyed by the crown. They have the they autonomy have the to decide that for themselves. You know that in Romania you have several churches wi which were owned by the Catholic Church before right. the communists yeah. came, and now there is a big discussion exactly. because you know the government decided that now it has to be back to the right. Orthodox Church. Yeah. So you can do a first in time, first in right. We've yeah. been here longer than anybody else, and we're a traditional church, and therefore we have a superior claim. There are some communities that are adopting that as, as something of a halfway measure to deal with this hard question of communities in transition. There are other communities, uh, Bulgaria is a good example, Uzbekistan is a good example, where the State Department of Religious Affairs dictates which is the church and yeah. which of the factions represented amongst these disputants now gets the church. And we have a lot of examples. Yeah, Forum yeah. 18 is a good uh, news source yeah, right. for this, yeah. where a, a, an official will come in and say, that small 1% of the population in that local church is the church. Everybody else out. This is their church. Uh, and you see that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that caprice uh, rather regularly afoot and, in, and we, in communities in transition. We, we can understand better what we, uh, why we need the lawyer and why we need to study law. Mm, <laughs> mm. It's becoming um, very complex. Yeah, very much so. It's, it's always been complex. It's just now much more transparent. <laughs> more transparent. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so then what kind of principles are we able to take away then as we look at the study of law and religion? What, what is it that our viewers could say, hey, um, uh, what would be the message that you would say to the world uh, why this, this entire area of study is so important? Uh, law and religion are two universal solvents of human living. They inevitably interact. You have to understand them in their interaction. Secondly, that religious freedom is not simply the stuff we do in constitutional law. Religious freedom is the right of a religious community to exist with all of the complications that are involved in corporate coexistence now with, with one's own faith community, but also uh, in a secular society with many other forms of faith. Mm -hmm. And third, I would say uh, all the fundamentals, faith, freedom, and family, the three things that people will die for. Mm. At the heart of those issues are both legal and theological dimensions that have to be understood together. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate, uh, gentlemen, uh, your participation. As we look at the complexities, obviously you've enlightened us uh, tremendously as to just how complex uh, the whole area of law and religion is. And you've been uh, listening, been watching uh, I keep having a rough time with this whole concept of listening and watching, but you've been watching Global Faith and Freedom. I want to thank you and make sure you stay tuned to us for next time as we bring you the issues of the world. Hello, my name is Barry Bussey, and I'm one of the hosts here on Global Faith and Freedom. Normally, these chairs are filled with our special guests, but right now, I would like to invite you to come and join me. What do you think of our program? Are there other matters you would like discussed? Perhaps you have a suggestion of how we can do things better. We would like to hear from you. Contact us by using the information on your screen.